Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to this online panel, Accelerating Worker Ownership, a strategy session on co-op development in the digital economy and beyond. It's been a pleasure to work with Greg Deputer and Danny Spitzberg, organizers of this webinar, as they liaise with the brilliant minds that you're going to hear from today. Thanks also to Cultural Workers Organize with the Exit Exit, sorry, to Community Collective, as well as support from the Ontario Cooperative Association, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, and the Government of Canada's Future Skills Program. So the International Centre for Cooperative Management at St. Mary's University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral, unceded, and never surrendered territory of the sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation, who have stewarded these lands and waters since time immemorial. Mi'kma'ki is covered by the 18th century Peace and Friendship Treaties, which are a series of living treaties signed between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq, the Wollastook, Abenaki, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy nations, affirming a nation-to-nation -nation relationship for stewarding and using these lands. We are grateful to the elders past and present for their care of these lands, and we are lucky to live, work, play, and cooperate here. We share this land acknowledgement since cooperatives are organizations that often aim to care for people, lands, and the generations to come. And we also share this to keep this relationship with the local Indigenous peoples top of mind in the work we do with cooperatives within our center. I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat, where you're from, the lands that you're on, if you wish, your cooperative, and anything else that you'd like to share about yourself. I'm Erin Hancock, she, her, the Education Manager with the International Center for Cooperative Management in the Sobe School of Business at St. Mary's University. Just a quick note on us, your host today. We've been around for 20 years supporting the cooperative economy globally through research and education. You may know us most for our alternative to an MBA program for cooperatives that we offer online part-time to working professionals and cooperatives like yourself. Just to flag some exciting things that are coming up, we have a cooperative law summer school happening in Croatia in August. These are all things that still have spaces if you're interested. <laughs> um, a day-long workshop on cooperative governance happening in Arlington, Virginia, DC area, October 3rd in conjunction with the NCBA CLUSA Impact Conference, as well as another workshop on governance as part of the Directors Forum in Mississauga, Ontario at the end of October. A cooperative study tour to Costa Rica in February just announced. A cooperative study tour to Mondragon, Spain next June. Um, we're also releasing new publications and cooperative case studies all the time. So if these speak to you, I'll drop our link in the chat, managementstudies.coop. And if you're interested in Keen, you can go ahead and direct message me. Just a quick note on logistics. So please use the chat throughout to connect with each other, share your perspectives and register your questions to the speakers. We'll do our best to address as many as possible in our time together. This is a 90 minute session today. Please mute yourself throughout until question period at the end. We are recording this session and posting it to our YouTube channel so more people can learn from, from all the content today. So if you don't wanna be recorded, please do leave your camera off. And uh, I'll send a follow up to everyone after this session so that you have the recording as well as any other key notes that come up today. So now let me introduce you to our moderator for today's session. Amy Do, she, her, is an engaged member of the Fediverse as a community working group operations team member at social.coop. She's a uh, cooperative organizer with Young Agrarians and works in communications at Sustainability Solutions Group, a worker co-op environmental consultancy. She is co-author of a recently published book, Cooperatives at Work. Thank you very much, Emmy, for your willingness to take leadership today. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Erin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm joining you today from the unceded and stolen lands of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, who have stewarded this absolutely breathtaking part of the world on the Pacific Coast um, for time immemorial. Um, it's sunny and beautiful here this morning, um, and yet I'm super excited to be in front of my computer, and that's saying something, because we have um, some really great people here. Um, 
I, I just wanted to say that a lot of um, actually all of our panelists are quite used to doing the co-op 101 sales pitch, but today um, we're kind of taking it a little bit deeper and we're going to be exploring some of the challenges and getting to the meat of, of what it means to embody and practice solidarity within our current market economy. Um, uh, so just a little bit about the format that we're hoping to take today. Um, we'll start with introductions um, and, uh, and then we'll move on to some, some questions that we've prepared for the panelists. We're hoping that the panelists are gonna really dive in and, and, and sink into a, a meaty conversation. And then I'll try to save some time at the end for some questions from the audience. Um, please populate the chat with questions throughout because if there's no questions, then I'm gonna let them continue going at it. Um, uh, something that I wanted to especially make note of today is that we are gonna be looking at the goals, strategies and dilemmas of co-op development specifically in the digital economy, but we're happy to take that a little bit broader. And that's because Greg, I think I saw Salome here today and Gemma, wrote this amazing synthesis report that I hope all of you are going to read, um, and it's in the chat right now. So um, that is sort of the inspiration of, of this panel today. Um, so with that, I'd love to just jump right into the introductions. Um, and uh, for our panelists, please introduce who you are, what your project is, what your project's key goal is, and um, how do you do what you do? So let's um, maybe let's get started with uh, with Matt because you have so many. Hello. Um, yes, my name is uh, Matt Kendon. He him. Um, I'm based in London, UK, uh, and I'm a member owner of um, the Worker Co-op Outlandish, which is a digital uh, tech agency uh, which has been going for more than 10 years. Um, we deliver project work for our clients in the form of websites, dashboard, data dashboards, um, uh, digital campaigns, um, and we work with primarily with the charity sector and unions in the UK. Um, in 2016, we started a, uh, helped to start a network of um, similarly minded worker tech co-ops in the UK called Cooperative Technologists or Cotech for short, um, because we wanted to uh, um, work close, more closely with, with um, that sector of the, um, the technology sector in the UK. Um, and then also seeing a need in 2017, we started a co-working space in Islington, London, um, which was which is primarily for cooperatives to work together in close proximity um, and we use that space to do run events um, and run other projects as well um, the goals really for us are to live our values to expand the co-op sector in the digital sector and elsewhere um, and we do that by collaborating closely with our clients with um, other co-ops uh, in the uk and with the local community um, through space Four. Thanks, Matt. That's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, next, we'll, we'll go on to Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Michaels. I'm the accelerator lead with Start.coop. Start.coop is a US-based national organization whose goal is to make the path for cooperative entrepreneurship easier for cooperative entrepreneurs. We do this through a variety of ways. We create tools and templates. Um, we also run a 12-week virtual and hybrid virtual and in-person accelerator program. Um, so I'm excited to be here today and learning from my fellow panelists as well as from everyone in the crowd. Thanks, Katie. Um, next, um, Amon. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amon. Um, I am based in New York City. My, uh, I work as an assistant director at the Platform Cooperatism Consortium, which is uh, based at the New School. Um, so, I mean, at a time when we have like entire generations of people like who have only experienced the internet as a distant consumer oriented worker with little or no say in how it is run or how it is owned. Um, so our goal, our key goal is to change that. Like we focus on really the advancing the cooperative model on um, the digital platform. And how we do that is we believe in like a multi-pronged approach towards it. Like these issues are multifaceted and so must be our approach. Um, so we have, uh, we focus on community by hosting conferences. We have an organized network 
of uh, platform cooperatives around the world as a solidarity collaboratory that we have. Um, we focus on education, we run courses, we have a resource library, we have a directory, a Rolodex of platform cooperatives and adjacent um, platforms. Um, then we focus on, the third thing we focus on is uh, research and advocacy. Um, we have an institute for uh, research and a fellowship program, uh, and we uh, produce research reports and, and do consultation with governments uh, around the world to advance uh, platform co-op friendly policies. Um, now, I'm really excited to be here today, and thank you so much for organizing this um, and for moderating it. Thanks, Juan. Um, not ambitious at all. Um, <laughs> and uh, next, Johnny. Thanks, Emmy. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Johnny Sopichuk. I use he, him pronouns. I'm uh, the managing director for the Union Cooperative Initiative in British Columbia, Canada. Um, calling in from Burnaby, BC, on the unceded and ancestral homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations. Um, I always like to ground our work in reconciliation here in Canada. Uh, I'm, I'm often reminded by one of our cooperators, uh, Laura Gesege Cuthbert, who's of the Haida Nation, that cooperative values on, on this land call Canada, North America, Turtle Island have existed since time immemorial, and it's nice you're all catching up. Um, so we are we are a, a cooperative organization that brings together the labor and cooperative movements. I'm a, an artist and labor union organizer by trade and, and came into co-op development um, to support precarious workers who don't have the right to unionization under modern labor codes. They're working people, but not considered workers. They're considered independent contractors or, or small business owners. And I think they have more aligned with us than, than uh, the capitalist business class. Um, what we do specifically is we help those workers and their unions start cooperatives. So we first focused in the art sector. We've now grown into a variety of sectors. Um, we partner with, uh, we have a variety of different labor unions. Our most recent uh, partnership is with a group of animators who are looking to create a, a cooperative um, through their union, the Canadian Animation Guild. So we are an incubator accelerator organization. We have uh, currently have nine active cooperative projects with another about 30 on the go um, in development. And we're looking really as an organization and development hub to try and address the, the many, many, um, I would say, barriers to cooperative development that working people face, whether that's access to time, um, money, knowledge on the legal structures, um, and really help them build out that structure and then start to grow the model. So really excited to be here and, and uh, share and learn with everyone. Thanks, Johnny. All right, um, next, Vika. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vika Rogers. I work for Cooperatives UK, which is um, a membership organization composed of cooperatives within the UK. So our primary focus is to um, support our members, but as part of that, also to develop the cooperative movement more broadly, inspire people to uh, become part of co-ops or, or, or set up their own. Um, so my role at Cooperatives UK is Head of Cooperative Development, so very excited to be here to talk about this. Um, but also when I first joined Cooperatives UK, my role was really focused on Unfound, uh, which is a program that has been set up to develop the platform cooperative sector, so cooperatives that trade through a platform. Um, and so the aim of that uh, program is to raise awareness around uh, the cooperative model um, in the digital space, um, to attract funding to the space and to develop direct um, business support programs uh, for, for platform co-ops. And also uh, we'd like to do more work around policy as well. Um, so yeah, very excited to share learnings and hear the learnings from other people as well. Absolutely. All right. And finally, Tara. Um, thanks, Emmy. I'm so grateful to be here. My name's Tara Merck. Um, I'm a PhD researcher focusing predominantly on this idea of exit to community, specifically, but not exclusively in the in the Web3 um, and blockchain space. Um, exit to community kind of being the idea of 
the many, many tech uh, and digital platform startups that we've seen over the years, why has exiting to the public market slash selling onto a bigger enterprise been a more status quo sort of decision for many to make than to, to think about transitioning towards community ownership and governance? And exit to community really being about the idea of changing that narrative and kind of establishing this alternative strategy of exiting towards community ownership and governance alongside cooperative principles and values in the digital platform economy. Um, so that's what I research. I do that mainly through participatory action research, ethnography, um, and such things. And uh, I also do it alongside the Exit2 Community Collective, whom I'm representing here today. Um, the E2CC is, uh, is a loose organization of two dozen people interested in exploring and accelerating this concept. Um, we work mainly in developing uh, an awareness for it, but also developing certain templates and standards on how to make uh, community ownership and governance more accessible and, uh, and standardized within the digital platform economy. Uh, we produce a bunch of like academic research, but also popular writing out of it. Um, and yeah, super excited to be uh, chatting about all this today. Amazing. Um, so Tara actually wanted to start with you today um, as we open up the discussion. Um, as somebody who's exploring these different models for exiting to community, where do you feel like the cooperative movement is particularly well situated for in term when you're introducing the cooperative model for theory building and strategy strategizing? Um, and what have what insights do you have to share with the group um, that maybe we can we can sink our teeth into? I mean, I think the the core uh, inside and biggest takeaway that we started from is that community ownership and governance is not new. Um, it may be uh, unheard of in in parts of the of the tech uh, sector, but but we definitely have a lot of knowledge there. So a lot of exit to community is trying to translate some of the practices that have worked in in analog or traditional cooperative uh, sectors and understand what can we take and what can we um, complement when it comes to ownership in the digital economy. Um, I think one of the, the big ones um, that we've been seeing and thinking about a lot, and I think uh, many of us in the space come across uh, again and again, is this principle of autonomy. Uh, how do these startups and digital platform businesses, especially if they take um, external private capital at some point throughout their journey, how do they retain an autonomy where actually the, the steward uh, or, or member uh, decision making uh, remains theirs rather than, than some, some uh, big external investor? How do we templatize and standardize that through alternative term sheets? Um, alternative as an alternative to things that we know from the Y Combinator or the many, many consultancies that will um, kind of tell startups of how to structure these initial deals um, when, when they pass through certain programs. Another one that we've been thinking about a lot, um, and again, that I think we can learn a lot from the from traditional cooperative conversions, uh, is this idea of transitions. How does that work? Uh, I think here, particularly in my own work of also looking in the Web3 uh, industry, where people love to just drop a token and say, <laughs> this project now belongs to the community and is stewarded by them. And we say, no, no, um, nobody's been ready um, for this. I've, I once heard, I heard this terrible phrase of like, oh, exit to community, is that a dump on retail? Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we don't want to do. But how do you foster uh, what many cooperative conversions and co-ops have done is genuine uh, community ownership and governance that is sustainable in the long term. Um, so how do we do that and, and structure these transition phases? I think one of the big insights that we've had within the Exit to Community Collective, um, where, where various members uh, led by Danny Spitzberg in particular, I want to shout out, um, have been conducting case studies of uh, startups uh, transitioning to community ownership and governance, 
one of the things that we've seen is how do you implement these transition boards? Um, this can include some of the early founders, maybe even investors, leadership, but also employees and the broader community uh, when it comes to digital platforms in helping to steward the transition. How long do these um, transition committees need to be there? So I think those are really interesting uh, questions. And again, that we can learn a lot from um, co-op conversions in other spaces. Um, maybe associated with that is something around timing. Um, because, of course, maybe a little bit different to the, the platform co-op movement where generally exit to community kind of like advocates for it's OK for you to start as like a, as a founder and investor led uh, business, um, build build your values, show you, like build a revenue model, um, find out what you want to do, pivot it a couple of times. But keep in mind uh, the long term goal, especially in platforms. Um, of transitioning later on. And the question is, when do we do that? Because I think a lot of projects can start out with great um, ideals and plans, but when reality hits, that becomes a lot more difficult. Um, and, and thinking around this question of exit readiness, timing, and then how to transition, I think is, uh, is very, very important. And then maybe as last but not least, something that we've also really found in, in our work of thinking through what does sustainable community ownership and governance in the digital platform economy mean um, is that we've seen a lot of compelling case studies that are mostly grant financed. But one of the problems is that this grant uh, giving does not incentivize then to build, how do we build sustainable revenue models into those uh, you know, lighthouse projects, how do we incentivize them to, to build long-term leadership within those projects that, you know, a grant can only uh, sustain for so and so long? And kind of thinking, again, through uh, a little bit the financing aspect of what we'd like to see um, in, in the digital economy. So, yeah, and uh, definitely as sites of theory and strategy building, we have a lot to learn from, from a legacy industry and um, but a lot of experimentation really also taking place that is informing um, mine and and others research uh, in the collective. Thanks Tara that's yeah it's really fascinating to hear you talk about that melding and and, and and integrating of solidarity within traditional market forms. Um, so um, I kind of want to jump directly to Vika where you're really starting to to build uh, co-ops with your with your accelerator and um, so I'm you know kind of going from the exit to community to the entry into co-op um, and switching to like when as you think about recruiting uh, early stage co-ops into your accelerator you can also speak to um, the theory and how you built up and found as well that would, we, that would I think in um, play be a really nice play on on what Tara just introduced. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's been a, a, a very interesting journey. And I think there's, you know, there's something about, in the case of platform co-ops, about the fact that the, the discourse was generated from people in academia. And, and so I think there is a level of where there's platform co-ops are spoken about a lot. But then on the ground, how, how many platform co-ops are we actually seeing emerge? Um, and so that's one of the things that we've re really struggled with. We, we do have a program, we do have um, the support, but actually recruitment is, is really, really hard. Um, and I think there are lots of elements around that, uh, lots of blockers. Um, what we have done, uh, what we did last year, and we did this more broadly for, um, our cooperative development strategy, so not just for platform co-ops, but more broadly, all co-ops. Um, and so I'm just going to go through some of the steps that we've identified and, and that every step basically has some blockers. And I'll make some examples for, for platform co-ops. And what we did is really map out the journey. <laughs> and so where does someone start when they want to actually set up a co-op? And so we identified different phases. So we've got the first phase when people don't know about co-ops and suddenly they discover them. So what are we what are we missing missing there so where how do we reach audiences that don't know about co-ops 
people don't know about co-ops, at least in the UK, we really struggle to find the right spaces um, to talk. So that's very much, I think, about us going out, but also changing the language. We tend to use a language that when we're in the co-op movement, we understand, and when we go out, people don't understand. Um, so we did some work on that on, on platform co-ops. So when the first accelerator started, it was like, join the unfound accelerator for platform co-ops. And then we were like, yeah, but some people don't even understand what a platform co-op is. <laughs> so, you know, we did some, it's not like huge things that we did, but we just started talking about it as an accelerator for ethical digital businesses. And that allowed us to reach a much broader audience. And then they would enter and start understanding, okay, but what do they mean by ethical businesses? Oh, owned and governed by their members or their users. So it's really making sure that you create the stepping stones for people to, to enter. The next phase was, okay, wow, this is interesting. How do I find out more? And so making sure that there's information out there that people can explore, there are ways for people to engage with the cooperative movement when they're in that exploration phase. Um, and so that's the work we've done on our website. So there's content and resources on our website about platform co-ops, case studies, uh, a founder journey, and et cetera. Um, and then there's uh, the question, is a co-op right for me? And that is like a crucial moment in that journey. And that's where we're trying to find the right uh, ways to address that question, be it that there's like someone that you can call at Cooperatives UK to have that conversation, or there's a specific event that someone can attend uh, that is all focused on trying to unravel what it means to set up a co-op. Then you decide a co-op is right for you. Uh, help. Where do I start? It feels all so difficult and complicated. <laughs> Uh, and that is a huge barrier. It is a massive barrier because we need to make it easy to, uh, particularly in the UK, to set up a normal business. It's thirteen pounds. You do it on a on the a company's house website. It's really easy. And so, how do we create it to make it easy to set up co-ops as well, um, and that that doesn't become the reason why people don't set them up? So that's where the work we're trying to do now is really identify what, how can we make it easier. Um, and, and and then, yes, the, the setup process and what that involves. And, and even there, there is one thing is just the legal form. And it's like, okay, what legal form I, do I want to set up? But what we're interested in is setting up sustainable businesses that last, you know, that are sustainable over time. So, yes, we could just provide the legal form and say this is the best thing for you. But what is everything else that a sustainable business needs to, to get started? And that's something that happens a bit before the, the incorporation and, and after and understanding what are the various elements that we, we can provide for that. So that's what we've been doing for with Unfound. We've tried to provide all the, the, the elements that, that can help them. I would say in the case of a, an accelerator, the biggest barrier for recruitment, I believe, is yes, reaching the right people and making sure that people know about it. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Unfound, it's a very in intense program. It's once a week, a full day on Zoom for 10 weeks with work to do in between. Who can afford that? It, it, it's, it's really, it's not inclusive. Um, it worked really well for us during the pandemic because people were on furlough, so they had time to dedicate to it. People were prepared to spend time on Zoom. Um, but how can we make these programs more accessible? Because, yes, we're taking them from the startup culture, but from the startup culture, we have people that have either their own you know, wealth or they have uh, VC money coming in or angel investors. The accelerators we're building are not for that audience. And so how do we address that? So we do have other programs at Cooperatives UK where it's like um, direct support, but on people's own terms. Own, 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 it has to be delivered within six months, but it's arranged around their time and it's specifically tailored to their needs. And so that is something that we do across for any type of co-op. Um, and so we're learning from, from both elements. Um, I think there's a place for accelerators, but we also have to be careful that they exclude uh, people. That's it for me. Thanks so much, Vika. And you raised such an interesting point. I think this um, dovetails really nicely into another 
point of discussion, which is, you know, what are the compromises that uh, the co-op movement is making or does make in in deciding what to include in development? Does it replicate sort of these problematic things that we see in in our in our society that we're trying to provide an alternative for? Um, Aman, I'm wondering if you would be uh, open to speaking about that, um, about any, you know, areas that you think your your project compromises on in terms of the values and um and what are some of the things that you 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 don't uh yeah thank you so much again uh for inviting me here and thank you to the other speakers um it's just a wealth of information right now i'm trying to just process uh what vika was saying uh, uh, let me just start by saying that uh, so I'm, I work at the Platform Cooperative Consortium and we are not a co-op or a government body. Um, our goal is to advance platform cooperatives and make them flourish. Uh, and we do that by sort of being a glue between projects that are uh, you know focused on community and worker ownership on the internet um, uh, and with institutions that support them with people who are interested in platform co-ops at large. So being sort of like a clue between them. So from the position of uh, Platform Coffee Consortium, which has worked with a variety of cooperative aligned projects and all sorts of institutional actors, um, I mean, it's a very interesting vantage point for us to be in, to be able to be involved in all of these uh, projects in some way or another. And let me speak to this question from this perspective and what we have seen. Um, so what are we willing to compromise on? Um, I think um, the first thing that came to my mind was the legal structure as a cooperative, which Vika also um, pointed out to. And I'll take the example of Up and Go. Um, Up and Go is a cleaning um, home cleaning services platform cooperative that's based in New York City, and it charges only a five percent um, commission um, to help run the platform. And the ninety-five percent of the revenues go directly to um, you know. Uh, Latina, mostly immigrant female member owners. Um, and it has uh, very strongly like embedded like democratic decision-making and has made it into a very successful model um, that provides like a wide variety of opportunities for like, especially like the workers which are left most precarious in the digital economy. And so, but but the question, the, the point I'm getting at here is that like up and go successes uh, in, uh, not an insignificant part attributed to um, strong institutional support um, from uh, this place called the Sunset Park Family Center based in Brooklyn. Um, and they were able to like, uh, you know, fed rate like three different co um, uh, cooperatives together as an LLC. So they are not registered as a cooperative. Um, and I think like and that's something that I've seen like some uh, new projects get hung up on is like trying to register as a cooperative. And I think like, um, and from what, from this position, from what we have seen, like, I, I think that is not something that um, we should be stuck on as much as like people give it attention to. Like it can be useful uh, down the line um, to, especially in like, you know, the legal jurisdictions that you're based in, which provide like certain, um, you know, tenders or benefits or subsidies, um, if you're registered as a cooperative, but like, uh, for the most part, from what you've seen, like, um, what's really important is like getting your project off the ground, um, making sure that you have a sustainable business model and, the second part, what I'm going to get into is uh, related to that, which is the question you asked, where, where do we refuse to compromise is, is actually implementing the cooperative principles without necessarily being um, registered uh, formally as a cooperative, right? Um, and so regarding that, like um, one big challenge that um, platform cooperatives uh, particularly face is like, how do they, uh, you know, balance their cooperative identity while at the same time being uh, successful digital businesses. Um, uh, the co-op movement has traditionally been strict about like adhering to cooperative personal, uh, principles, but been less open to digital experimentation. But on the other hand, some technologists and entrepreneurs, like um, especially in the IT uh, sector, have been too loose with the language of cooperatives and not really, um, uh, you know, like when once we start off a startup, like it's also get very easy to get consumed within the business side of it all. So therefore, it's like I think it's important to focus, um, at like in an uncompromising way 
on some principles of cooperatives while at the same time we explore their um, potential for the digital economy. And so without like, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to take too much time because I know that there are uh, <laughs> more of a lineup and I would be much rather interested in the discussion part of it. Um, the, I'll just mention one um, uh, principle, which is, uh, you know, the very key one that I think uh, is the principle of cooperative principle number six of cooperatives, the principle of cooperation among cooperatives is, I think, particularly relevant for the digital economy where smaller platform co-ops struggle to compete against like larger and more established players. So I think by working together, forming alliances, um, they are able to like pool resources and share knowledges um, in a way that can um, you know serve their members and help just make them more competitive. Um, uh, and one example that I want to very quickly give is uh, um, so the government of Kerala, which is in southern India, um, is uh, is developing a network, a cooperative network called the Kerala Food Platform, which is basically federating um, 1,600 primary cooperatives, um, 3,000 banks and dairy cooperatives, and a total of like 11,000 cooperatives together. Uh, and the aim is to like improve like the soil quality and productivity of small farmers by basically pulling in like very, very small cooperatives in Kerala together into like a one large federation. And on, uh, on onto a digital platform, and I and it's doing like really uh, as bringing about like some really amazing results. And these projects that I'm mentioning um, from Up and Go to Kerala Food Platform is also particularly because we have also been involved with them in, in some capacity in like putting that forward and putting the research together and stuff. So like we uh, would be happy to take questions on that, and I would I'd be very happy to hear uh, from others from it. And I'll just stop there. What we can compromise on is the legal structure and what we cannot compromise on are the cooperative principles with a focus on um, principle six cooperation among cooperatives thank you yeah it's so interesting that you 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 that the co-op model itself is is the compromising factor i mean tara you spoke to that as well at the beginning so interesting um that but um you know speaking of intercooperation um katie i wanted to ask you about what you think the barriers are to co-ops being able to support other co-ops um i know for example that we're using zoom and uh, not uh, meet.coop or some of the other uh co-op alternatives to some of these platforms so um, if you wanted to speak to that. Sure, sure. I think something we think about a lot at start.coop is about how do we scale co-op development and how can we collaborate together and cooperate together to do this. And something we, a lot of here in the US, a lot of the co-op development is one-on-one, -on -one, very personalized because you, you have to, there's local restrictions, local considerations, a lot of co-ops that come from community groups. So a lot of that makes sense. So where we're trying to address um, a niche in the market is how can we help co-ops scale? How can we, in through our co-op development, be scalable ourselves? And so learning from others is is a big part of what we do. I've been taking frantic notes um, during this and I will rewatch because um, I'm learning a lot um, as someone who's relatively new to the co-op world in addition. I think um, what we what we want is helping people set up sustainable businesses, um, and you know there's a lot of principles in making it easier so folks can search and start their co-ops um, quickly. And you know, like Vika was saying, it, it takes 15 minutes and 13 pounds to start a cooperative in the in the UK, and it's similar here across the US. So how can we help people like? Through their, through their cooperative development, not need thousands and thousands of dollars with lawyers' fees to um, set up their cooperative. Are there, are there tools we can collaborate together and create um, to like make it a little easier for them? Um, and again, I think we can learn a lot from what others are doing around the world, even though there's so many unique and local considerations to take in, into consideration, but can we learn from each other and create tools together and promote each other's tools and in each other's programs? Whereas, you know, we've just closed an application round at start.coop for our accelerator. And I've thought about the other folks in this room and what actually this, your program might be better for some of the applicants to our program, like those kind of tools and ways um, to work together. Um, and it's just, I think if at the end of the day, for us, it's about focusing on, on the founders and the founding teams and um, helping people know that cooperatives are an alternative um, business model that um, 
it's it's and that you need to have a solid business as part of that too i think um and learning from others around the world we have people like um uh, contact us all the time about um, learning uh, learning about what we're doing and we're learning about what they're doing around the world and how can we collaborate together. And I think, um, I know for start.coop, we have a specific remit to focus on US and Canada. However, um, I'm, you know, and that's because of our financial setup or whatever else, but, you know, like I think these types of events are really important to learn from what's going on in the UK, what's going on in Germany, what's going on in India, um, so that we can learn from the best of what's going on in the world. Katie, just to add to that, what, what do you think are the barriers for you to be able to, to create those inter-cooperation kind of ties and to collaborate more actively with Vika and Aman and <laughs> I think it's been, an, I think we're a startup ourselves um, for us personally. So like we've been in our zone and, and funding restrictions. I, I think um, we kind of explored the idea of where, who would fund this kind of work or how would we be creative? Um, so we've been doing it very informally. Um, so I'm interested to know, I think like platform co-ops consortium does a lot of this work um, in bringing people together um, and I think we've not been focused on it personally, just because like we've just been starting in startup mode. We're we're five years old now, um, so we're starting to get past that. But um, you know, we were for um, a lot of our existence, we've been two and a half people. Um, so uh, so just the time and and resource constraint, like like others. But um, I think yeah, yeah, I think if we had a, I don't, I think it's these informal relationships right now for us. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded short, but it's a big one. Um, Matt, I wanted to move, hope, I was hoping that you could help us like move from just the co-op movement um, to thinking about how we can integrate this, uh, the co-op model into mainstream business development and, and maybe in tech, but elsewhere, like what, what are your thoughts on that and, and how have you been building that? Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, so I think this is this is a, um, a really interesting space that Outlandish is, um, is moving into. I think one of the things that we recognized was that um, we had put a lot of time and effort into how we work. So we um, we are a non-hierarchical structure. Um, we use sociocracy to run our business. We use consent-based consent -based decision-making um, to make decisions in our business. And we had learned a, a lot through a very long process over many, over many years, very difficult process over many years um, on how to uh, run um, a business projects in that fashion. Um, and so we saw an opportunity for us to live our values and express our values through the activity of the business. Um, and so a few years ago, we started um, a part of a business called Building Out, which runs workshops that um, provides training for um, people outside the co-op sector and also in, and anyone is welcome, um, but, um, but particularly towards you know, um, other people in the tech sector on on how to um use uh, how to use sociocracy how to use consent-based decision making to um to run the business and that's been very successful um it's been very successful in introducing um uh, uh people outside the uh, co-op sector uh, to ways of working that are cooperative that are collaborative that are very very different from um uh, how normal businesses are run um we are um we're teaching them how to communicate um, in a in a way that is very different from my experiences in uh, you know a normal hierarchical business structure, um, and one that I think is is not something that um, you know we learn as uh, individuals normally in our life. I think one of the most difficult things I found being in a cooperative is how to communicate as a human, uh, and that is something that um, you know we've learned through our time at Outlandish and we're now um, uh, trying to teach others. So that's one way in which we can um, uh, talk about cooperativ cooperativism and uh, cooperation and collaboration um, without um, relying on sort of um, in incubators and accelerators. Um, it's a core part of our business now and it's and it's been very successful. 
Um, we also do that in the way that we run our, the, uh, the other core part of our business, which is the um, delivering um, project work to uh, to clients. And I'll call them clients for now. Um, the way in which we work with with um, our clients, with the charities and unions that we work with, um, is very much in a collaborative collaborative space. I think a lot of um, tech agencies um, in a similar space to ours, but who aren't cooperatives, will work in a, in a, in a fashion that is sort of delivering a service to a client, uh, meeting the requirements, um, and, and, um, and, and it's just about delivering the work. For us, that's not how we want to work. Um, that's what we're in a cooperative for that very reason. So when we're working with our clients, um, we're not delivering a service, we are building a team with that client. So we are um, working together on a project as equal partners on that project. Um, they are providing um, uh, the expertise in the domain that we're going to be building in and we're providing the technical expertise. Um, and so we're, we're building in a very collaborative way. And that's another way in which we're sort of expressing our values and our cooperativism um, into, into that sort of normal business space. Um, just through uh, working with them, um, and we could have worked in a very different way. We could have we could have worked as as a service provider, um, just providing these tech services. But that's not the way in which you want to work. Um, and then moving on to space four, which is very different. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, it's a co-working space based in Islington. It's a real space, which is very different from uh, how Atlantis normally works. Um, it's a uh, a, a place where we provide uh, desks and spaces to anyone who wants um, a place to work, um, to meet people, um, to uh, gain a sense of community, um, which is, you know, one of the things that is quite difficult to uh, find uh, since we've all started remote working. Um, and, and, and that space provides an opportunity for lots of informal conversations to happen. So it's not just for cooperatives who um, for working in space for, um, we have people outside of that space who come in and there, there's an opportunity to have very informal conversations with a huge a number of people working in the cooperative space um, who will use that space um, in, in the co-working sector. Um, space for also runs events. Um, we're not running events about cooperatism, that's part of the things that we do, but we're also running, running events just within the tech sector so last week we ran an event um, during Lung London Tech Week uh, at Space 4. Um, it was definitely highlighting um, sort of uh, tech for good, social good through tech. Um, but through that, we were able to talk about cooperativism um, when we were speaking to people who attended that event, um, who are from outside the cooperative space. We were talking about cooperativism. We were talking about the sort of the work that we, we all do and how and the way that we work. And there were people there who were interested in um, uh, who are interested in, in starting startups, but we're looking at the cooperative model. So just being a place where people can come and and, and investigate the cooperative model and, and be amongst cooperatives um, has been a, a fantastic way to sort of express within the tech sector in London um, sort of the, uh, that that way of working. And then finally, outside of the tech sector, Space4 is also doing a lot of work just within the community um, as part of it this sort of community wealth building project that we are, we're in partnership with, with Islington. Um, so last year we ran the Cooperate Islington project, which is about starting um, cooperatives in a sort of based in Islington. And, and beyond that, um, we do things like outreach into schools, talking to uh, children um, at an appropriate level about sort of the cooperative business model. Um, providing a sort of insight into when they do go into the workforce, what that looks like and what that looks like from a, 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 a cooperative point of view. Um, and then we're also working with um, other local communities um, where we are um, we are providing uh, an opportunity both as a space to work, but also with a lot of, a lot of insight and knowledge into the way cooperatives, and cooperatives work. Um, providing that to local communities as they sort of start to build um, communities themselves, um, perhaps using the cooperative model to um, do things like start um, uh, you know, food co-ops for um, uh, working through the sort of the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing in the UK and, and people are experiencing all over the world. Interesting. So it looks like you're taking a very traditional approach of, of introducing co-ops, but also a soft approach of sort of sprinkling in co-ops to non-co-op sounding events, um, which is uh, which is interesting, um, a great approach. And I, I sort of wanted to wrap this section up by, by calling on Johnny. I know you don't work necessarily directly in, in the digital space, Johnny, but what 
are some of the ways in which your project really kind of highlight some of the, the different approaches that you can be taking? How does your project especially shine? And what are some of the, the theory pieces that we can be pulling out from, from the practices that you're really embodying coming from that union background um, in, in formalizing the, the co-op movement and, and pushing sort of the, uh, the principled agenda that, that we have? Uh, wow, okay, lots there. Um... Uh, and five minutes. Okay, I'm going to try and like be laser focused. And I'm going to preface my my remarks by saying, um, I am just as critical about the labor movement and modern labor movements as I am about co op movements. So uh, uh, if, um, if anything I says hits a nerve, know that I'm, I'm more critical about myself and our work as well. So there's this uh, uh, pervasive belief in the cooperative movement that, you know, people have to put their skin in the game, they've got to put capital in, they've got to put time in. And, and um, I, I, I don't know the legal term uh, for this, but I'd say it's bullshit. Um, and, and I say that with respect, but my experience as a labor organizer is that the structural, uh, whether they're uh, market forces, legal structures, governments are not designed for working people. So we need to go out there and help people start projects. So many folks would look at the work we're doing as a top-down approach to co-op development. And, and I really push back against that. We're trying to build structures um, and networks to help workers and communities form cooperative models, whether it's a business, whether it's a nonprofit. Um, so, so uh, we started this work out in the arts community. Um, it was a two-year project. We were talking to artists. We ended up launching our first co-op, uh, the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Co-op that centered labor values. And we created a, a commercial screen print, printing uh, space um, doing stuff like this, like a t-shirt for our local labor council. Uh, and um, what came out of those conversations with our artists was that they needed somewhere to build community, access flexible work. Um, and we knew we could do that by sharing our artistic skills collaboratively with partner organizations. So we launched Value Co-op, 17 worker owners, um, just at the outset of the pandemic. Traditional co-op belief would be, you know, those 17 workers if it was a $170,000 operation to begin with, they'd have to capitalize it themselves and each put in $10,000. And the workers we're working with, young artists, folks living paycheck to paycheck, the idea of putting in a $10,000 buy-in is just impossible, um, uh, whether or not there's access to, to financing. Um, so we were able to crowdsource uh, our pre-orders. We got the help of Van City Savings Credit Union, local incredible credit union uh, that's incubating co-ops, um, and launched the, that co-op. And since then, we've now grown the UCI, which is a multi-stakeholder co-op that's looking to try and um, identify gaps within the cooperative development ecosystem, but also critique some of these issues we see around self-exploitation, labor exploitation, especially in the consumer co-ops market, um, and all of these other issues. Uh, and we started all of these different uh, cooperative projects with various labor unions. Um, I'm a storyteller. It's a big part of what we do in, in labor unions. We want to agitate, we want to educate, and we want to inspire people to take action. And we do that through solidarity. So I'm going to share two stories with permission about um, the work we're doing and the impact it can have. So the first is a, a story about Gigi Mercado. Gigi is a um, grandma, Filipino grandma sewer who was laid off during the pandemic. She was cleaning um, buildings um, and uh, uh, lost her job. And so she started producing these beautiful fabric masks out of her closet in East Vancouver um, to help pay for her medication. And she was selling them on Facebook. So I connected with her on Facebook and I said, Gigi, your masks are beautiful went and bought some, I'm like, you're not charging enough for your masks, like, you know, five bucks a mask, how long does it take you to create? Um, fast forward, after a few conversations, Gigi joined the co-op, um, started selling her masks through the co-op, we allowed her uh, to raise her rates. So she was now not making a poverty wage, she was making more than a living wage and launched her mask project, um, sold 300 in the first week, 
and then got an order request from a partner labor union for 4,000 masks. And that would have kept Gigi working uh, around the clock for about seven months straight. And so um, with Gigi's permission, we built a new co-op around her mass project. And we partnered with IATSE 118, the theater workers union. Um, and they had about 20 costume shop professionals who um, were laid off during the pandemic. And so we started this mask making production um, with a grant from Van City Credit Union. We had about 20 sewers across the lower mainland who are producing masks from home. We were, um, you know, uh, I learned how to cut uh, fabric um, particularly poorly, but learned how to, you know, build that out and built this project. Um, so that when, when I'm talking about we're incubating and going out into community, you know, Gigi has incredible cooperative values. She's a Filipino grandma. She was born in cooperative communities, but um, had never had access, whether time or capital, to the cooperative structures in, in Canada and North America. Um, our most, uh, one of our most recent pilot co-ops uh, is a personal training co-op and a young guy named Jack uh, from Brighton, UK um, is a personal trainer here. And uh, he, if you don't know the personal training industry, um, he worked for a form of a platform company. Uh, they're essentially, won't name name that uh, company, uh, they're, they're horrid and most um of the companies in this industry are horrid. They take at least 50% of Jack's training fees, they then charge him a fee to use the platform, which is um, which the owner of this company called a legal form of a pyramid scheme. Um, so we met Jack, we learned, we talked about unions, we talked about the co-op model. Jack was like, hey, I'm on board, I wanna start something. Um, so we piloted a new uh, personal community training co-op with Jack last year. And in six months, at a 25% of his caseload, his client load, um, Jack would go out and provide at-home training services. Jack saw a take-home pay increase um, of $8,883.26, I think, if I uh, got the numbers right, um, and scaled that over a full year. Jack is looking to see, moving from like a, you know, Forty to fifty thousand dollar annual wage to anywhere from an uh, seventy five to ninety thousand dollar wage. This is his current um, capacity as a trainer, and this is an industry that's us at the UCI. We are we're not um, we are a multi stakeholder co op. We're a nonprofit. Um, there's a movement to just create worker co-ops uh, based on the man Mondragon model, which is brilliant. We are not prescriptive of what type of model um, uh, uh, our, our groups of workers need to pursue. Sometimes it's a worker co-op, sometimes it's a multi-stakeholder, a nonprofit solidarity co-op. And in Jack's case, looks like there actually could be three co-ops coming out of this project we're now trying to expand. Um, a worker or producer co-op, uh, secondly, a, a membership-based co-op. They want to create a community gym, which there's a huge network across the UK. Um, so similarly, and a platform co-op um, to help market their skills, do online training classes. Um, so I really believe the cooperative model uh, is endless. Um, and uh, we, we have, as a part of our ethic and values, that um, we need to move at the speed of relationship. Um, but I do believe that the crises of our time, whether it's climate change, um, late stage capitalism, uh, racism, discrimination, mean we need to be able to move at scale and move quickly to provide alternatives. Um, because with the absence of access to these kind of structures, we're going to see communities, and I think we're already seeing it turn to fascism and Trumpism. Uh, and reactionism. And these are folks who are scared about the future. They're scared about the forest fires and climate change and losing their jobs. Um, so yes, let's move at the speed of a relationship. Let's help individual co-op projects um, slowly get off the ground, but we need to build our structures to very quickly move at scale and at pace. And um, we're just trying to start to do that here in Vancouver, BC. Thanks, Johnny. That was a good story with you. Um, <laughs> I'm hearing 
the themes that I'm hearing is that there is an education component, obviously, to everything that everyone's doing. And yet it's the building of the proof of concept that I think is, is unique to every project and how you're doing that. And whether that's like, you know, let, let's forget the co-op model, the legal structure, and just um, and, and try to foster cooperativism in a different way, or, um, or let's like, start with the co-op model, but build in some of the practices of, of co-op development in, in other ways. And so that's that's such a fascinating thing. And I think it plays to this idea of compromise, where are the areas in which you're willing to compromise? So I'm gonna open the floor to the six panelists to respond to and, um, and provoke each other a little bit. We're running behind time because I've done a horrible job as a moderator, but um, y'all are so interesting. It's really hard. Uh, if one of you wants to put up your hand to start the conversation off, um, that would be fantastic. If not, I will ask another question to somebody. Well, yeah. maybe I can jump in briefly, um, just because I, I, I thought that closing statement also of Johnny's uh, around being a little bit critical of moving at the speed of relationship, which is such a fantastic way of putting it. I thought that was really interesting and also tied in a lot with um, what Matt spoke about as in showing up to, to traditional or like non-cooperative tech events and being there and just talking about what you guys are doing and, and the you know cooperative spirit and this alternative way of organizing. And then again, um, where Vic was like, yes, throughout this accelerator, a lot of it is about sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, right? And talking through what are the specific requirements that this specific project needs and spending hours with lawyers and, and figuring out then, you know, how, how do we make that work? And um, I think like less of a critical response, but just tying it together that I feel that this is such a pervasive maybe problem or thing that we're all encountering across the space of like, organizing around cooperatives in the digital economy and how to spread that word. Um, I still personally believe that this speed of relationship um, is actually just right because I do think that the spread of values and principles implies building a type of culture and culture is not going to be built by, I don't know, giving everybody a uh, hundred dollars who <laughs> commits to to do to to launching a co-op be it legally or in an alternative structure um but I think that's really like speaking to some some inherent tension that feels like also cooperation amongst cooperatives um and whatnot could could scheme around how do we solve that and who do we talk to um again in my own experience it's a lot with the web three space where I see a lot of things extremely critically, but have had also um, similar experiences maybe to what Matt spoke about, where a lot of people are also interested and they are not aware about it, uh, of like, what is a, is a co-op that, that Vic also spoke to, et cetera. And how do, we, how do we find spaces that we can start building relationships with where we do have the intuition that there is some like, openness and willingness to like explore and embrace and maybe also extend um, the culture of cooperativism to new areas. So, yeah. Thanks, Tara. Anybody have any? Yeah, Katie. I think um, it's just been really interesting. We were really lucky in over the past two years, we've had a partnership with the AARP Foundation here in the US, which is the largest um, group of advanced, it's for the American Association for the Advancement of Retired People. Um, so we've been working to promote cooperative entrepreneurship as an option for low income folks aged 50 plus. So ARP have, have resources and have communications reach and have, have, have kind of a brand recognition. So one of the interesting things we found through this project was that folks don't know about cooperatives, like they don't really know it, but then when you talk to them and they know, oh, I go to a, a credit union, I shop, um, I know um, I shop at Ace Hardware, which is a co-op. They, they're like, oh, actually I know co-ops. And um, we worked with people who didn't, were interested in starting care, home care 
businesses and um, we're like, oh, I could make that a cooperative. That's so much better for myself and my employees for um, when we work together. So I think one of the big biggest learnings we've had in the past two years through that partnership is actually working with partners outside of the co-op world has been game changing for us. And we're looking for other ways, like Matt was saying, like um, Johnny was saying, working with folks outside of um, in, in tech and how can we make partnerships in tech to use our specific co-op knowledge um, to make, make it easier to start those types of businesses. Fascinating. Vika? Yeah, well, building on that as well, a bit on, on partnerships, but also bringing in funding. Um, so I think this element of the of uh, timeframes is, is also a big challenge because um, when you're talking with funders, <laughs> They want to know within a year how many co-ops is your project gonna or program gonna help set up, and that's something you know that we we struggle constantly in saying yes, great, you want to fund us for for a year, but you know we're not gonna see the impact of that work until maybe one or two years down the line, and so there's an element both of education but also just yeah finding aligned funders or partners that understand the timescales and and that you can continue to work over things for for a longer period of time and i and i think that's a bit the challenge we're facing at the moment with the platform cooperative movement as well it's like it's clear it's going to take time for having you know good case studies of platform co-ops that have succeeded because it takes time for a platform co-op to start grow succeed um, and so it's just like, even if we feel that maybe we're not going as fast as we should, or um, just we shouldn't give up, basically, you know, it, we need to keep on going and it will be, you know, hard to attract. But we, I, I think there was a moment in which we were attracting more funding into the space. And unfortunately, that sort of hype has, has sort of stalled, stalled, but because we need time to actually prove the concept and that will take time. And I'd say also the criteria that are used often become a barrier. So, for example, working with local authorities, often it's um, we need to prove that a certain amount of people will be employed, etc. But actually, co-ops are not only about employment. It's about voices of stakeholders, etc. And so having other criteria to measure what is the value of this type of business uh, beyond employment, which is obviously one of the important ones, but not just the only one, I think it's also important. Yeah, time. Um, it seems to be the crunch for all of us. <laughs> Time and money. Uh, interesting. Uh, the the two things that we're, we're taught to fear from, from an early age. Um, just to sort of like kind of hone in on a little, some of the, the, the obstacles to getting out these uh, co-ops off the ground is, you know, the, the supporting of one another and the, and the scaling and the expectations of tech in particular, how, how are, are we cultivating any changes in, in um, expectations of consumers, for example, and, and what they expect of tech? Um, are we asking our co-ops to to start playing with that and pushing back on that? Um, are we, do we have any um, un, unrealistic expectations of tech platforms that are placing an undue burden on co-op um, co developed tech um, from adopting them, for example? Um, this wasn't something that was, that was raised, but is a little passion of mine. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, seeing as I have you all in the room. And um, so, Anyone want to give that a give that a shot? I'm going to pick on you, Amon, because you have the biggest network. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll just um, quickly speak to uh, one other thing that was mentioned, if you don't mind, uh, which was uh, when they were emphasizing going to non-cooperative spaces. I, and, and I really can't reiterate that enough that we really have to go uh, beyond cooperatives here. Um, because, you know, I mean, what I've mentioned earlier that like there's an entire generation that's like grown up with 
a particular approach to the internet as you were mentioning right now which you know it's it just feels something very alienating and distant and especially as more and more work is getting moved to the digital platform it's very important to like put forth a different idea but like before we even do that like i think the biggest challenge we have encountered is that a lot of people don't even think it's possible um that you know the internet can be something that you own and that you govern and that can be community uh, that could be owned by the community and governed by the community and i think like two approaches that we found that uh, to uh, yeah, i'll just mention two approaches like it's not d2 approaches and, and that's another thing to it is that we have to not think of this as like a one stop solution like we have to approach it from a range of um in solutions there is no like one solution to this so and like a couple of them uh, that have, you know we we're, we're focusing on one is like education like it's very important to like um show that like this is just not not it's not just possible but that it's already happening and like there is a strong history of the internet being uh, cooperative of of it embodying cooperative principles and being democratic and those are the aspects which are really marginalized that we have to highlight and uh, so that's one aspect of it and the other is like um for for any kind of like projects like this like especially platform cooperatives to be able to compete um it needs big institutional support um so we need to like you know uh, get involved in politics um, get politicians on board like and get a uh, big government funding like and get um, you know big foundational funding to be able to like you know um, at least it you know to get these projects get off the, to get them off the ground and sustain for a while have some runway time to be able to compete and you know show that it works um yeah sorry i'm not sure if i directly addressed your question but uh, you could Go okay so it, it was kind of a mean spirited <laughs> question anyway um <laughs> but i do um we are at quarter past and so i wanted to make sure that i highlighted there's been a lot of questions in the chat that i haven't been doing a very good job of moderating but luckily aaron has um and the first question that kind of came through sort of play, um points to the struggle that these areas of compromise that um everybody has been speaking to um, how can digital cooperatives in mesh embody, or even just cooperatives in general, in mesh embody the interests of stakeholders like the public or service users? Um, put another way, what prevents a co-op business from deciding to put profit ahead of the needs of service users or the public interest? And you know, Aman, as you say, like if we're going to be advocating for big dollars coming from government, how are we demonstrating that co-ops are indeed going to? you know, circumvent some of the and not replicate some of the problematic behaviors that we've seen coming out of, of non non co op um, enterprises. So does anybody want to give that one a shot? Yeah, Matt. I can speak to that a bit. Um, I, I mean, it, that is definitely a very, a very difficult thing. I think that it's um, uh, in one way, obviously, is to uh, um, look at multi uh, multi stakeholder cooperative model. Um, that might be an option that Space Four eventually goes down, where um, both the um, the workers who run Space Four and also the people who attend Space Four um, as um, workers in the space um, have uh, control over over that space. And then in fact, that's the way it's run currently within Outlandish, where um, there is a uh, a circle for Space Four using the sociocratic method and that is made up of um, both members of outlandish and then also um, people in the community within space four who run that so looking at um, engaging with your users in in a variety of different ways and that can be in, in a sort of a structured way um, where they are taking part in decision making um, but also in the way that you know outlandish works in general which is just to the way in which we work and want to work is to be work in a very collaborative way with with um in in our case our clients so um they there's a, a, a build-up of trust um and that is that's a way in which we 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 express our, our values through the way in way we work um and beyond that like within the community i think um we uh our, our wider network of co-tech um, is a way of, of sort of speaking around um, uh, uh, tech co-ops in the UK. Um, 
we can speak of sort of that community of we're all going to keep each other honest. Um, there are, you know, there are 43 members of that network and um, we're going to keep ourselves honest because there is a, um, a reputation that we want to maintain for both cooperative cooperativism in general um, and tech co-ops in, in particular. Um, so by having that network of um, other groups, there's lots of ways and different ways in which we're working, but we are all looking at one another, how we're working and whether that is um, benefiting that wider goal of sort of increasing that, that share of the tech um, business within the UK. Keep each other honest. Um, well, <laughs> Matt, what, what do you think would happen if you felt like one of the, the co-ops within your network were, you know, starting to not embody some of those principles or values? Um, so, mem so membership is um, to the network is is based uh, um, on democratic vote. So, if if someone wants to uh, someone wants to join the the network, there are rules for for that. Um, so, if those rules were broken, then that would need to be um, put to a democratic vote. Um, uh, and we we each member of the network um, would have a single vote in that in that regard. But I think it's more about um, identifying what has happened, because it may be that there's a change to the way in which they're working that is very different from the way they were currently working. But that doesn't mean that it is uh, necessarily a bad thing. So um, there are lots of ways in which um, the, the sort of the, the the co-opters work within Kotec. Some are not for profit. Um, outlandish is, and we we pile that profit back into the business. Um, but that means we we sort of charge at a, ourselves at a higher rate than some of um, the other um, co-ops. And we see both of those models as being valuable uh, within the network. Um, so hopefully we'd be able to find space for for any model as long as you know the goals of the network and um, corporatism in general are being are being followed. And um, yeah. Johnny, I wanted to ping the same question to you. You know, you say that you're kind of going at it with a top-down approach. Um, how do you think those 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 members that might not actually have experience with the co-op model might be doing this out of like a more of an enterprise mind and not necessarily of an associative mind, um, and maybe not philosophically that inclined, but are, are in you know life circumstances where if they don't band together, they're not going to have this enterprise opportunity. How are you helping to foster that in the development process? Yeah, I think um, uh, that's something we're learning as we build and, and you know, making mistakes along the way. Some of our co-ops, we've seen some pretty significant conflict internally, um, which has led to people leaving and uh, co-ops evolving. Um, you know, our, our, our folks... Um, uh, teach us like slow down and conflict can be generative as long as the power um, imbalances are taken into consideration, the proper supports are provided. So we're, we're looking at building better training and onboarding systems so that folks know what they're getting into. Um, uh, so it's not just this pursuit of but both on both sides, right? Like this pursuit of a utopian ideal of what a co-op is, like, you know, revolution is here and and now you're going to go work on a business plan and make sales calls. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. So, um, you know, we're seeing some challenges there, um, but we're also seeing a lot of a success uh, and, and part of, um, part of, where I think those successes have been is trying to remove some of the structural barriers or at least build out our own infrastructure, knowing that in British Columbia and in Canada, it's going to take six months at least for your cooperative to get a bank account and a business number um, because of issues with our, our central government, the, the CRA. So um, before, you just have to kind of sit and wait to be doing any business until you got that business number and account. Um, so uh, we allow our, our co-ops to come together, um, start working informally as a collective under the UCI umbrella um, and start doing their business through the UCI. So their film co-op would be a, a good example. They came together last August, five um, creatives uh, who had already worked together. So there was already that foundation and trust and they had worked through a lot of conflict. Um, and so they started doing their work as the Seize the Means of Production video co-op through the UCI. 
did $150,000 in sales, like tons of work for members, a lot of collaborators brought in some beautiful projects um, uh, and collaborations. Um, and they actually forgot to incorporate uh, the business, the name expired and then had to rush to do it again because they were so busy working. Um, and so I think there's ways that we have to build out our own infrastructures. And this is where I'm talking at, at scale, right? We need to make sure we can like create all of these systems of support so that when we know groups of cooperators are, are coming together or interested parties saying like, hey, I, I want to do co-op work together. It's like, okay, let's start running. But we're going to run as fast as you want to and as fast as your group wants to. And what we've often found is in, in our co-op, sometimes there's a difference, like some folks want to go really slow and other folks want to go really fast. Um, and so what we're starting to see is like some of the co-op projects, value is a good example with the 17 where it's bridged off now, there's that's that project is split into four different co-ops um, and it's bringing in new people. And, you know, I, I see that being a good thing. Um, and, and, and I just want to touch on that point around, you know, taking this conversation out of our, our, our bubbles. Um, so we operate our, a cooperative development center in Chinatown. We have a partnership with a benevolent association. So it's a bunch of young artists and Chinese elders. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and in our production space, we've turned it into a co-op development worker organizing center. So we have a, a speakeasy through the trap door. It's a false wall at the back of the screen printing shop where folks can come in and have beers and coffee and, and build community. And it's, it's been incredible. And we, uh, one of our co-op projects, uh, Mayworks Festival of Working People in the Arts, we um, had a Filipino arts, uh, just grew artists come together to sing songs of revolution and and poetry and ballads. I practice my Tagalog, I'm terrible. Um, but at the end of that, a number of the, the um, artists came up to me and said, you know, we wanted to start an arts co-op forever, but we just didn't know how. And I said, well, you know, here's the space you can do that and let us help. Um, so I think there's there's so many different ways we can approach um, approach this work, uh, and and um, I'm I'm really my belief is we've got to create our own systems, recognizing the structural barriers and make it make it easy because um, there's it's working together is tough. It takes time, and so we got to try and remove uh, structural barriers for working people. Thanks, Johnny. Um, Vika, did you wanna? speak to one of the earlier questions sorry oh, hi. there was a question around tech and uh, I don't know if I've understood it correctly but I'll try and answer it um and this might not everyone will agree I know it's always a difficult question <laughs> um but I just wanted to mention like in something that we talk about in the accelerator is really in the case of platform co-ops is trying to divide uh, what a platform co-op does in different layers and so and this doesn't come from from me but it's like some literature around platforms um and thinking of a platform business as there's the actual business there's the infrastructure on which that business runs be it the technology the software the processes and there's the data that we process we collect etc and the ideal of the platform co-op movement is that we own and govern all those three elements and that we in a cooperative way. However, from the experience that we're living, it's that is a real, really difficult to be, okay, everything is like we develop the software, we, we do everything according to cooperative principles. So what the advice I give is, you need to make you need to make sure that the business is working if the business is working the other elements won't be where you won't even need them or have them etc um and so the the aim of the co-op is to serve the purpose of the co-op and its members and the tech has to enable that and so where you have to start you might have to start with some proprietary data uh, software to just get off the ground and yes it would be ideal that then you can develop it um and the same the same with data obviously we would prefer our data not to go through other people's software but if if 
if at the start you need to do that way, just make sure that you're transparent and clear with, with the people that you're working with um, and serving. But having said that, the question of scale and growth of this movement, where we have seen platform co-ops develop open source software or um, co-opy, uh, what's the term uh, that co-op cycle use, but they have a spe special license that only worker co-ops can use the software. Like those are what allows the movement to scale. Um, and so the more we can build this software in a way that we share it across the movement, the, the, the more we can actually grow the movement as a whole. And we're seeing more co-ops now, though I, I won't mention the names, et cetera, but adopting you know, the, the software of one uh, platform co-op and using it somewhere else. Um, so the more we can collaborate on that, the more we can reach our goal of making sure that software, data, and everything is done in a cooperative way. Thanks, Vika. That's a beautiful note for us to sort of wrap up on. I Again, there's been so many really interesting conversations and questions being asked in the chat. I think that will also be sent along, and I hope that we will continue to have this kind of conversation um, because we've just unfortunately scratched the surface. I was hoping we could just oh, right down to the meat, but we need some warming up time, you know? So um, thank you so much for this. It's been really generative for me. I've got to answer my own pet questions throughout this process. Um, I hope it's been useful for the audience. Erin, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to share? I can't hear you, Erin. <laughs> um, well, Erin's fixing her mic and she's the Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes. Technology. Oh, that's ironic. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I wanted to say this was so rich and we've uh, had a lot to chew on that we'll continue to be mulling over. I've got a list of 25 ideas and people that I want to contact. So I think we're probably all feeling that. So thank you so much to Emmy for everything today and the speakers. And we, again, we will send a follow up to everyone so you can review this again and get more out of it and uh, also review the uh, report from Greg and, uh, and partners. I also wanted to say Greg and um, I don't know if uh, Gemma and are, are you still here? If you wanted to do a quick wave and a hello, introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm I'm Greg. I think that Salune may may, uh, may still be here. Uh, there's Salune. Oh yeah, hi. Uh, good good afternoon, everybody. I'm I'm Salome. Um. Yeah, uh, so I've worked with Greg and Gemma on this publication um, on um, finding what is already known about uh, cooperatives in the digital economy. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Awesome. Um, so I think we're ready to wrap up. Thanks so much for attending, and um, we hope to continue the conversation.